Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. On this edition of Minnesota Original, performer Regina Marie Williams prepares for a production at Mixed Blood Theater with her vocal coach, Nancy Groff. Bridget O'Malley and Amanda Degener of Cave Paper craft handmade paper and sculpture. Bluesman Alex Crankshaft Larson and his band, The Gear Grinders, perform at First Avenue. If you're looking for help of me, oh, whoa, you're barking up the wrong tree. These artists and more, now on Minnesota Original. Walk out on treatment, don't lose what you've won. You've struggled for years, but you've only begun. I'm Regina Marie Williams, and I'm a performer in the Twin Cities. I am currently in rehearsal for uh, Next to Normal, which was a Broadway musical. It's being done at Mixed Blood Theater, and I play Dr. Madden. Make up your mind, you will live at last. Make up your mind that you're fully alive. Embrace what's inside. Replace what has died. Make up your mind you'll survive. Originally, Dr. Madden is played by a male. And so vocally, I'm making adjustments because the role is for a tenor. So sometimes I have to sing it an octave up and sometimes a little bit lower. The price of love is lost, but still we pay. We pay anyway. So Regina, this is our first chance to get together after you after you start a rehearsal, and so Nancy Groff is my voice teacher. And that means that she helps me in finding ways to stretch my voice, how to make it fuller in places where it's weaker. Hunger, 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 hunger. Good. Hunger, 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 hunger. Good. Can you feel your bones waking up? There's some cheekbone yeah, yeah, in that and a little bit I in do. the nose, too. Okay. Regina is extremely talented. She has tremendous instinct and intuition about how she approaches what she does. Um, to work with her, she's a very kinesthetic, so that you show her how something feels, she feels it, and then she remembers. We practice those kinds of things that people might think are quite silly, but they really help me in performance. These exercises came out as a byproduct of research and study. Many of them are very eccentric sounding and looking. My children used to sit to the side and actually wait for certain ones because they would just split their sides laughing. But the tongue ones are especially serious. All of them have a very serious intention. Okay, so now for the exciting, eccentric, and non-glamorous part of the, <laughs> of the occasion. Let's see if we can get the tongue out on the okay. lower lip. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> nice singing. Without drooling even. No. <laughs> Sometimes we do exercises and you can feel your body sort of vibrate. It's very exciting. I, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're waking up already. Have a seat. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> Let's get it on. I don't always have specific music that I need to work on when I go to her, but when I am having difficulty with a particular song, Nancy will give me exercises to be able to make that song work for me. And, and the challenge is here. Oh, it's up there, see? Whoa, my goodness. Concrete! Good. That's it? Yeah. Okay, but I'm sitting. Okay. You're sitting in this scene? <laughs> yes. Oh. I went to Nancy recently with a specific problem that I was having in Next to Normal. The range, it just went up to my higher register, and it was challenging to get there, but it was more challenging because of how I was sitting. I couldn't seem to get the air. And so we did a few exercises on the notes rather than saying the word. 
right now. What do you do? What and then she did a few vocal exercises to get me in and out of that spot. And then I was able to actually sing on the note. Do you still feel your head is filled with concrete? She's there. Better. Still not to my satisfaction, but I now know what to do. So if I just keep the rest of it a little bit you lighter. You light, you don't let it drag you down as much as possible. Easy for me to say. Are things becoming clearer with the treatment? Yes. Is life less cloudy than it was before? Well, yes. Do you still feel your head is filled with concrete? <laughs> no. She has an opera background. And I sing more jazz and blues, and I think people are a little surprised when they say, oh, you go to Nancy Groff because she's a bit of a different style than I am. Well, I guess it doesn't matter if I can get the job done with the tools that she gives me. And she has given me some extraordinary tools. And I think that she works with a number of people who have vastly different backgrounds, but that's not important. What's important is she knows how to get you to use your voice. When I saw everything Re Regina was doing on stage, I was so proud and I feel it is the sum total of everything that we were working on together. Ooh, what a little moonlight can do. When people ask me what I do, I oftentimes say I'm an actor who sings. I have worked in a number of theaters in the Twin Cities. 10,000 things. And illusion. And I've also worked at the Guthrie. I was in Crowns and recently the Burial at Thebes and also Carolina Change. I've worked at Penumbra Theater, which I'm a company member there, and, and of that I am extraordinarily proud. One of my landmark roles is Dinah Washington in Dinah Was at Penumbra Theater. I think that that show, I'm sorry, I know that that show propelled me to a different place, to a different status in the Twin Cities. I sing at the Dakota and the Capri, one of my favorite places to perform. And recently I was in a show called Eartha Kit, the whole kit in Caboodle. Just like hot ships see and rolling around and just can't keep the blues away. Two years ago, I think, I was honored with an Ivy Award for the role of Mama Nadi in Ruined, which was performed at Mixed Blood Theater. And many people saw that piece and, and remember that piece. And so that's, that, that was a very a memorable role. I love roles where I get to do it all. Fall down, laugh, cry, yell and scream drink, whatever it is they want me to do. I like those roles because they, they're not just one dimensional. Day after day. To be able to do this, what I do as a career, is a real blessing. We used to say that the stage is a sacred place and that to be able to perform and to do your craft, that was Fortune. That's a huge blessing. Doing my work is challenging, but like everybody, we have to balance family and other things as well as our work. And sometimes that's hard, but I shouldn't complain about it. Okay, I do. I complain about it sometimes, but I do feel very fortunate that I can do this for work. There's something about that heat and that, that dangerous thing that you can't touch, but yet you can kind of touch it with these tools. And I joke that it's suffering for one's art because it really, I mean, it, it's hot. I'm always just trying to look to do something different, I hope, something I haven't seen before. A non-glass blower might not really know why that's unique, but a glass blower might look at it and go, God, how in the hell did you get that? I 
I have had the studio for nine years. When I finished college, I was unsure of what I was going to do with my liberal arts degree. I wasn't an artist at all. I didn't have any real formal training. I took no art in college. I took this glass workshop up in Wisconsin. You know, I was okay at the basics and was kind of intrigued. And uh, this guy and his wife, his name is Jim Engerbretson. He said, well, why don't you come down to River Falls and enroll as a special student? That's how it started. The struggle for me was finding confidence in this kind of artistic voice, which I'd never, I, I don't have a, you know, of artistic voice. I didn't, that was something totally foreign to me. And, and so gaining the confidence to say, okay, I want to make this, took some time. <laughs> The cane pieces I made first in my studio here because I didn't have any color. And so it's not that complex an idea. It's really a pretty simple idea to just drop these things in there. The assumption is that they might just all glob together and become a ball and, you know, this ugly mass in the middle. But with a little bit of finesse, you can get them to create something pretty interesting to look at. There's something really appealing to me about making something interesting out of clear glass. Stop. I think also as a Minnesotan, you know, as an icy, crystalline kind of thing, it really appeals. are going to make a piece lined with copper and silver foil. Putting the copper and the silver on, there should be some golds. The copper and the blue will, with the silver, should create some green. First, we're going to stick the copper in it. Now you start to understand why maybe you don't see other people do this. It's like, why, what, are you, what are you doing and why? Sticking your hand in is kind of off the wall. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. You're going to stick your hand in there? But I really like the idea. This has developed into a bit of a refined dance. I'm going to blow off my hand. It gets hot. But as long as you have these gloves and you can use some air, it's, it's, uh, it's OK. This is really hot until it's all lined. And then I can keep my hand in there a little bit longer. The metals are going right against the colored layer in the vessel, and adding that extra bit of mineral to the color and the extra heat, it just causes them to create a whole other palette. It's a little bit like pottery or salt firing in that you put these things together and you kind of know what's going to happen, but there's still some room for serendipity. If the glass and I are on different wavelengths, it can be a struggle. And so when you make a nice piece, it's like, ah, oh, that, that's cool looking, you know? And I really like that. Um, there's still that kind of surprise that I'm able to make something, you know, like that. And when it's, I think, elegant and clean, and that's exciting to me. Cave paper is a handmade paper mill that focuses on flax paper that is dyed with walnut and indigo. We've been in business for almost 20 years. Our customers are limited edition printers and, and makers of books. And then there are also calligraphers and, and other artists. This is actually the way that flax grows. It's a very tall plant. We actually buy the fiber 
already, with the straw already removed, we take this fiber and then we put it in the machine. There's no chemicals at all. Really what's happening is the fiber is taking on the water and it's becoming something else. The decisions I'm making with the beater are very, very important. So like a photographer makes choices about apertures, and certainly, you know, this is our tool. This is our main tool for paper making. And then this will be enough for like four sheets, so I won't have to add every time. We have a mold that gets pulled through the vat. The pulp rests on the top of the mold and the water drains through. There's a part called a decal. You've heard of a decal edge. There's a uh, frame that goes around it. You just take that frame off and that makes that beautiful expressive edge. And then you transfer the piece of paper onto a blanket. And it really is starting to be a piece of paper now. There's a stack and there's a blanket between each sheet and then that gets put into a, a press, and it's a very simple press. It's um, basically a 50-ton truck jack, and the, the pressure, uh, you jack it up, it goes up and hits crossbar, the pressure goes back through the jack into the paper. But that's just the beginning of CAVE's process. We're not even halfway once we make the sheets of paper, and then they're ready for coloring. We do indigo that's dipped several different times, and so each sheet is slightly different. You can control it a little bit, but we really don't like to control it that much. We like the nuances that just occur on their own. For walnut, we have several varieties. We've got solid walnut and crackle, and some of them are combinations, indigo and walnut. And we've started to do some, some brighter colors with pigments rather than dyes, so you can really broaden the range of, of what's possible in terms of color. To make the black, for example, we do a layer of indigo and then we let it dry overnight. And then another layer of indigo, then let it dry overnight. Then a layer of walnut, let it dry overnight. Then a layer of walnut, let it dry overnight. Then a layer of gelatin, let it dry. So that's for one sheet of paper. The reason it has such a great quality to it is because each time you're working, you're sort of putting your soul into it and you're, you know, you're touching it and you're, you know, you're, you're building it up. And, and it, it, that shows in the paper. What we make as a product line also informs our artwork and vice versa. So Amanda does a lot of large scale sculptural pieces and I do some print based paper making. This is a book titled Overlook and it's about the moments in life that you often overlook. It was also about looking at the horizon or the panorama of landscape in a very abstract sort of a way and just that kind of Rorschach-like way of the human mind wanting to find pattern within something that doesn't necessarily have a planned pattern in it. I like to make things you can walk around inside, large-scale sculpture type stuff. I've always been motivated by trying to step lightly on the planet, so it's important to me that the sculptures are ephemeral. We just threw some two by fours together, we put some mosquito netting under it, and then we put a layer of interfacing material inside. We poured the fiber, water, and the slime together, and we had all those people shushing it around, official term, shushing, and we just made it as even as we could. So then we just lift it out and put it on the floor, and then laid wire, trying to make kind of a grid pattern, like weaving, really. And then the second sheet just goes right on top, and so the wire is trapped inside. But really, the magic happens when nobody's around. The high shrinkage pulp, as it shrinks, it creates this beautiful undulating shape. And I knew that this center panel would be like a drum, you know, that it would be tighter because the wire is a complete circle. It's a collaboration with Bridget O'Malley. 
it sort of spontaneously came up that our work influences each other. This is from a series of labyrinths in watermarks that I've done. And this is a representation of the labyrinth that's on the floor in the Shark Cathedral. And it is done in paper pulp so that there's thin and thick areas in a process called watermarking. What I really like about it is how the thin areas require the thick areas and vice versa in order to exist. And you can't have one without the other. So it's just kind of linking things together and like the circle that's in this big piece of paper kind of echoes the circle that's in the middle of the labyrinth here. So. It's sort of after a while it takes a life of its own on, so it's not necessarily what I'm putting on the sculpture. Sometimes it's sort of like, oh, this is what it wants to be. So I just kind of have the parameters set up and, you know, I just got to listen to what's going on and see what happens. My name's Alex Larson, uh, otherwise known as Crankshaft, and I'm a musician from Anoka County, Minnesota. Crankshaft is a project that started as a one-man band, like a busking uh, street performing project. It's kind of evolved to now a, a three-piece band. And now she's a mom. She got a big brown tan, mini brand. A lot of people listen to music with both their ears and their eyes. And I go up on stage with a suit and a tie and my hair slicked back and we have an upright bass player. And then they get the feeling that it's like a rockabilly band. There are elements of rockabilly in it, but in my heart, I would rather think of myself as a blues guitar player. You're barking up the wrong tree. If you take yourself on a musical journey, you're going to find yourself going back to blues music. I mean, whether you start with Christina Aguilera or the Black Keys, which is a lot closer to that, you're going to end up going back to blues music that came from this country. I just went to Clarksdale, Mississippi in April. That's in the heart of the Mississippi Delta. That was a cool experience because it's kind of a community of people that have embraced kind of the lo-fi quality of the original music that came out of the Delta. It was just cool to be, you know, where a lot of what we listened to was born. It was a great experience. I would definitely encourage others to go check that out. It's the place where American music started, and uh, it was fun. It was a good time. Well, I'm a scrap collector man, and my head's in your garbage can. Being from Anoka is cool. I love the country. I love the laid-backness of the country. But I also love, you know, the art scene and the community of musicians from Minneapolis. So I've thought about it you know, about what makes me different from musicians that live in the city. And I think that one of the biggest things is trying to break through to people that are accustomed to listening to cover bands. I think that it's uh, a good lesson at how to like break through to a crowd that probably doesn't really care about what you're doing, <laughs> as horrible as that sounds, but it's like, I think that there's definite truth to that. The funny thing about all of that stuff is, is that if you learn how to work a crowd like that, and then you get in front of a really good crowd and do the same thing, the response will be like, will blow you away. I'm really
really having a good time doing what I'm doing. I feel like I could keep rocking until I'm in my 80s, you know? I want to be Hound Dog Taylor. I want to be uh, playing slide guitar on a rocking chair on stage, you know, with the amp turned to 11. So, I don't know. I'm going to ride it out as long as I can. I'm a hometown boy. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you so much. Barking up the wrong tree. Well, you ask me where you land me. You say I'll hit your back. Every time I ask about it, you ask me to cut you some slack. Well, I've had it on the ear. We you left us the ways. I was willing to help you once. Will you let me rephrase? Yeah, we love the more. Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.